All right. Uh, so, uh, good evening and welcome to lecture seven of PH 870 quantum computation. And um, we are almost done with the linear algebra part, uh, which I, uh, which might be like tedious and boring for many of you who might be familiar with all this material. Uh, so, uh, yeah, you will be happy to know that we will start with. Uh, quantum gates and operators, uh, quantum computation proper uh, on Monday onwards. So there are a few more uh, aspects that I want to cover uh, before we do that. Uh, okay. So in the, in yesterday's lecture, uh, uh, when I had talked about uh, this thing, um, when I was talking about time evolution, right, I had introduced this this operator, uh, which is the the time evolution operator, right? And so what this you what you see is uh, an exponential of a matrix. Okay, so now. Um, Again, uh, many of you might already be uh, familiar with uh, functions of matrices and so on and so forth, uh, but still uh, it is something that uh, I should uh, talk about briefly. But first let me uh, finish my discussion about tensor products and tensor product spaces. Okay. So and the part continued. Okay, great. So we have two uh, vector spaces. The tensor product is given by A and B. If you have a basis I, is a basis of A and J, I'll put a label here, is a basis of B, uh, then I tensor J. is a basis of A tensor B, okay? Uh, okay, now, few more uh, things are needed. So, so if I have some state, uh, um, so again, we'll, we'll look at uh, this thing. Like before, we look at a let a two spin one half uh, or spin one half states or spaces. Okay, so they are both two dimensional, and as uh, I discussed, we will make use of this uh, of this basis. Okay. Right. So, so these are our basis states. So the basis of uh, A tensor B this is the A basis this is the B basis. And the basis of A tensor B is the set of four vectors. Uh, 
right? So there are four of them. I won't write all of them down. This is the basis of eight and six. Okay, so if I have, um, and I'm going to make a small, small change in the notation, just to make the notation a little bit simpler, which is that I'm going to refer to uh, this up state as zero and the down state as one. Okay, so then if I if I have something like this, if I have a state like this, uh, right? I'll write it like zero tensor zero, and then I will abbreviate, abbreviate it further to zero zero. So it should be understood when I do this that in this uh, this belongs to A and this belongs to B, okay? So this is the notation, all right? So then our, our uh, basis elements, all right, we can write them out much more efficiently. This, these are our basis elements, right? So if I have any state psi in my tensor product space, I can write it as a superposition of these four states. Okay. And um, now the natural question to ask is how do operators act on this tensor product space? Okay. So uh, let's say that I have a, uh, some operator like this. Uh, so Z tensor X, right? How, how does this act on this state psi? Well, again, you have to remember that this operator, this will act on H A, and this will act on HB, right? So what will happen is, uh, for instance, if you take Z tensor X, it will, how will it act on the first, uh, this uh, zero, zero, right? And the rest will follow because they are similar, will be, this, will, this state will become alpha, and then Z will act, Z will act on zero, on the first zero, and then X will act on the second zero. Okay. So, um, and, uh, just for clarity, let me, show you what happens for one more state. Here I'll get beta, now Z will act on the zero of the first Hilbert space and uh, X will act on the one of the second space, okay? Now, um, the same way that uh, uh, states can be decomposed into a basis vectors. We can also have a basis uh, for the operators, right? So the operators which act on a Hilbert space or a vector space also form a linear space. linear vector space, okay? So you can find, um, so how, how, how does this work, okay? So if you have, um, let's consider a again, spin one half system. You have some operator, right? Which takes, a, which acts on the spin one half system. So this operator 
is has some four matrix elements, right? Alpha, beta, gamma, delta. And um, let's say that, uh, so this, this operator can be unitary or it can be Hermitian, right? Uh, so the, the set of all such matrices, we say are, is an element of what is called uh, GL2C. Okay, so what is this uh, GL2C? GL2C is the group of linear transformations. So this is the G, this is the L, acting on two dimensional complex vectors. Okay. Now, so this, this corresponds to the G, L, two, and then let's see. So for, uh, for uh, any group of this form, uh, there is an association, there is a, another object which is called an algebra, right? So this is, this, is, this is what is called a Lie group. And associated with a Lie group, you have something called a Lie algebra. And this Lie algebra, it's a, it's a vector space. Well, it's an algebra, but uh, so an algebra is a, is a set of objects which has the properties of vector space, but it also, uh, so you can add elements, but you can also multiply them. So, so I'll say, which is sort of like a vector space. It's a little bit, it has, a, more structure than a vector space. And the relationship between these two is that you can take an element of the Lie algebra and uh, the notation for the Lie algebra is written in this way. So with small letters, lowercase letters, so this would be the Lie algebra of GL2C. Now, in our case, um, um, we will be talking about mostly about, um, let's say, let's say we, we restrict our attention to unitary operators. Okay, unitary operators, and we'll say we'll further assume that these unitary operators correspond to matrices uh, which have determinant plus one. So this would correspond to the group SU two. Okay, so this is the group of. unitary matrices which act on two dimensional complex vectors. The complex part is not mentioned, but it's uh, assumed. So this has a Lie algebra, which is written as SU2. This is the Lie algebra. Now I'm not. Uh, I don't. I'm not going to teach you group theory. Okay, don't worry about that. This is just uh, a very, very brief uh, 
overview of all of this. Uh, I want to get to a punchline, which is the fact <clears throat> that that uh, that the way that we can uh, we can write any uh, vector as a linear superposition of certain basis vectors. In the same way, we can also write any operator as a linear superposition of certain basis operators. That is the point that I want to make. And that, that is, uh, so, so for that, we, we, you know, I mean, a little bit of this uh, terminology is, is useful. And so what is the relationship? What is, an, what is SU2? SU2 is the Lie algebra. SU2 is also consists of a set of two by two matrices. Okay, so they are both two by two matrices. But what is the relationship? The relationship is the following, that uh, let's say that you have an element of, um, so, okay. yeah. So let's say that uh, you have, uh, you have these poly operators, okay? So let me write them down again. Uh, we have X, Y, and Z, right? These are the poly operators. And I have introduced these to you earlier, right? Uh, let me see. Where did I? I think it's here, right? So I had shown you these matrices earlier. These are the poly operators. And uh, these will be very important in pretty much everything going forward. So it really helps to uh, memorize the matrices, these matrices. And I will give you a very nice mnemonic device for remembering those matrix elements. And we we do the following so so we can write this as a vector okay which we write as a sigma with a arrow on top okay so this is a set of three matrices right so you would say that sigma 1 is equal to x sigma 2 is equal to y and sigma 3 is equal to z for instance and um, now we take uh, some vector, okay? A vector, a real valued uh, vector, okay? V1, V2, V3. This is an element of R3, okay? So this is a real three dimensional uh, and it's a unit vector, real three dimensional unit vector. Okay, so now, If you take any linear combination of these three matrices, right, these three matrices, if you take any linear combination, of these poly matrices. Okay, so how do we take a linear combination? Well, I would write V1X, V2Y, V3Z, right? And what is this? This is also a matrix, right? Because this is, we are taking a matrix, multiplying by a number, and then adding three such things together. So we get another matrix. This object, this matrix, is an element of this Lie algebra, SU2. And so this is what I was saying earlier when I said that operators on a Hilbert space form a linear vector space. So in this case, uh, the operators are the set of unitary operators, the vectors associated vector space has X, Y, Z as the basis vector. So you, these are the basis vectors.
these are the basis vectors of SU2. And again, this is one set of basis vectors. Uh, you can always change your set basis. And so constructing a linear combination of these uh, gives you an arbitrary element of this Lie algebra. And this brings us to how we go from the Lie algebra to the Lie group, which is the following. So we can write this as V dot sigma. Okay. And the way we go from uh, the Lie algebra, so V dot sigma is an element of Lie algebra. What we do is we exponentiate uh, this object. And this gives us an element of SU2. Now, uh, remember that if you have some matrix, uh, then you can- you Sir, can I didn't something. understand this last step. What you did? Yeah, no, I'm I'm elaborating on that. I'm elaborating on that. So if you have some matrix, you can take the exponential of that matrix, right? The exponential is also another n-dimensional matrix. Okay, so if A is an n by n matrix. Then this is also an n by n matrix. And you can define this as a uh, series sum of this form, right? The way that you normally take the exponential of any, any number. Okay. So, So this, this object this object V dot sigma, this is a matrix, right? You can call it uh, A if you want. When I multiply it by I theta, it, it is another matrix, right? So when I exponentiate this, I get a matrix, okay? And what I'm claiming, what I'm saying is that this set of matrices, matrices of this form, they correspond to elements of this group SU2. Okay. And uh, if the need arises, we will see later how SU2 is actually very closely related to the group of rotations in three dimensions. Uh, if if the need arises, and but the main point that I want to make is that any any operator that can act on a qubit, right? And in this case, I'm restricting to unity operators with determinant plus one. So such operators they form a group they form a group called SU2. Because if you take any two unitary matrices with determinant one, you multiply them, you get a third unitary matrix with determinant one, right? So you get the structure of a group and that group is SU2. So the point is that any, that operators acting on a Hilbert space uh, can be represented uh, so they have a basis, which is a linear vector space, which is this Lie algebra, which, which is this set of matrices X, Y, Z. Now, the question is that when you talk about basis vectors, basis vectors satisfy orthogonality, right? Basis vectors, you, you typically want something like this. Orthonorm orthonormality, right? 
okay again this uh, whole basis vectors satisfy some kind of orthonormality but in this case i am talking about matrices so when you have vectors you know you you can uh, you can see how this object would be a real number right this is just the dot word the question is what does it mean for orthonormality for matrices right what does it mean if i say two matrices are orthogonal to each other because that is the that is how i can say that this is a vector space right well we define something called the uh so let me write it down first and okay so what uh, this object is this is the um trace of the product of m and n okay and this is what i am going to claim is the inner product or the scalar product well it's not a scalar because uh well it is a scalar sorry because the trace gives you a number right so it's the inner product on matrices and again my network is being slow here for some reason okay and what is this trace i i presume all of you know what the trace is but i'll just it's the sum of all the diagonal elements of any matrix right so this is an exercise for you verify that trace of x y is equal to trace of y z is equal to trace of z x is equal to 0 so so these matrices are orthogonal to each other with respect to this scalar product and furthermore uh we we say that the norm of uh the norm of the matrix the matrix norm is given by matrix norm is given by the trace of m with m okay so actually small correction i should put a hermitian adjoint here because the same way that for vectors we have to take the hermitian adjoint here also we need to take the hermitian adjoint so let me put an adjoint here adjoint okay and so you have should confirm and see if you to confirm that uh, the norm of x and the norm of y and the norm of z is one so these are all matrices or if you think of them as vectors which have unit length okay so i um so i have a question yes like uh, the orthonormality for matrices is it defined itself uh, like this or can it be derived from the orthonormality of vector spaces mm, yeah so that that's a that's a good question um i i don't know if it can be derived like i mean um, from the orthonormality of orthogonality of vectors uh this is a definition which works okay the same way that uh that this this right this is a particular definition of the inner product or the scalar product which happens to work right i mean you, you can have uh, many different choices of this inner product and and depending on the inner product the structure of your space changes uh if you think of your you know your uh 
in a product as giving you a distance between points or the distance of some vectors. Right? So you can have a whole different different types of 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 the spaces depending on the type of inner product you choose. But this is the inner product which. Uh, which 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 is which is nice in some ways, okay? Or natural, one would say. Though that can sometimes be somewhat of an ambiguous notion. What is naturality? Okay, and then a further exercise is the following, uh, which is that show that. Uh, this object that I wrote down earlier, v dot sigma exponential of this quantity, it turns out that this is when you expand out this exponential, you get cosine theta times the identity matrix. I'll just put a two by two so that uh, it's clear that we're talking about the two by two matrices. I mean, though we shouldn't need to do that every single time. Plus i sine theta multiplied by v dot sigma. Okay, so this is a, a very important exercise to do uh, because we will see later uh, that this corresponds to a general operator acting on a single qubit, okay? And to do this exercise, you need a little bit of, uh, I'll, I'll give you a few, a little bit of a head start. So something like this would be, again, expanding this, right? You'd get i theta i theta to the n then v dot sigma to the n divided by n factorial now remember that when you take the unit imaginary then i zero is one i one is i naturally i square is minus one i cube is minus i right and what is what is i four i four is again equal to i zero so when you look at this this expansion you will you will see that this expansion can be written as a sum of terms which which have an i right and there's a plus term and a minus term, plus term and a minus term, and terms which are real. So you'll get a complex term and a real term, right? This real term will give you the cosine theta part, and this will give you the, uh, what was that? Uh, yeah, it, this will give you the sine theta times V dot sigma part. Okay, and then you will need a little bit more, which is the following, which is not trivial. So that's why I'm spelling it out for you. You will need to know how to how to uh, take the nth product or the nth power of this object. Right? It doesn't look like it's something very simple. So let me show you how to do it. Okay, this I can write as v i sigma i, okay? And I'm using the summation notation, uh, which says that uh, according to which uh, repeated indices are summed over, okay? So when I write V i sigma i, you should read that as i goes from one to three, V i sigma i. So 
So we want to evaluate products of the form V dot sigma to the nth power. So first let's start with V dot sigma squared, okay? So what is this? This is going to be V i sigma i. This is one, one copy. And the second term can be written as V j sigma j. Again, there is a sum over i in the first term and a sum over j in the second term, okay? And now this, let me just put this here. This object, we'll write it like this, vi, vj, sigma i, sigma j. All right. Now, this, there is a, there are some algebraic identities which relate these poly matrices. Okay, what are those algebraic identities? So there is a poly matrix algebra. Okay, so we'll talk, come to that now. I guess I got sidetracked a little bit. I said I was going to talk about um, operators on a tensor product space. I mean, I did talk about that, right? This is, this is the side, how operators act on tensor product space. This thing, right? So now what we're talking about is uh, this poly matrix or algebra, which will be the basis of all of our quantum gates and so on. So there, there is a certain algebra that these poly matrices satisfy, which is as follows. And we are defining some new quantities. Uh, let's see. Right, sigma i sigma j is equal to zero. So what, what is the meaning of these curly brackets? These curly brackets denote what is called the anti-commutator. anti-commutator, okay? So this is, again, you should check this. It's easy to check, but you should still do it. Then we have the commutator. The commutator between any two matrices is represented by the this rectangular or square bracket. And the commutator between any two of these uh, poly matrices is equal to another poly matrix. And I'll tell you what this symbol that I've just introduced means. Again, many of you probably know what this is. This is the totally anti-symmetric tensor. So it's, so epsilon i j k it's equal to zero if i is equal to j or j is equal to k or i is equal to k it's equal to plus one if i j k is an even permutation of these three elements and it's equal to minus one if i j k is an odd permutation of these three elements. Okay, so in other words, if I have something like this, epsilon one, two. So two, what's one, the first condition? Uh, zero if? If any of the indices are equal to each other. So, so are we still using that uh, sigma i means summation of uh, thing or no 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 yeah we are we are but not in not in this case so this is again a little bit confusing uh, this i is the unit imaginary and we are using the summation uh, so what we are doing is we are summing over k 
sum over k. K is one of the indices we are summing over k. So let me let me explain how that works. Okay. So epsilon, if I have something like one one two, epsilon two one two, epsilon three three two, all of these are zero. Okay. Any time any two of the indices repeat, epsilon symbol is zero. When this is an even permutation, so there are two kinds of permutations, right? Cyclic permutations of a set of elements, right? So if you have A, B, C, what are the cyclic permutations? B, C, A, C, A, B. These are the even permutations, right? So when this is an even permutation, it's plus one. When it's an odd permutation, so one three two, two one three, three one two is equal to minus one. So these are the odd permutations. So A C B, B A C, C B A. These are the odd permutations. Okay. Uh, so let me let me write down the result, and I mean I I suppose. Things become a little bit clearer. Sir? Yes. So the yes. last element, epsilon, it's not three one two. Which one? Three two one. Three two. Ah, oh, you're right. Thanks. Thanks for pointing that out. This is epsilon. Three two one, right? And this is epsilon three one two. Okay, thank you. See, what we have is that when we calculate the the commutator. Uh, so, what is this commutator? I suppose I should again. Uh, so, this commutator is the following: the commutator between any two matrices. Is the difference of the product with the order switched, and the anti-commutator is the sum. Okay, so if I take any two matrices and I ask what is the anti-commutator, the anti-commutator is is this object. It is the Symmetric sum, uh, and this is the anti-symmetric sum, right? So this is the commutator, and this is the anti-commutator. Okay, and so poly matrices satisfy this relationship. That if you take the commutator of any two of these matrices, you get the third matrix. And you will notice that I'm going in uh, in cyclic order here, x, y, z. And uh, if you switch the order of the commutator, if you switch y and x, the the commutator switches sign. Okay, that is the reason why we have this epsilon symbol, right? Because what it's doing is that if you look at uh, this one, for instance, epsilon one two three is plus one, but when I switch two and three. I get epsilon one three two, and so that is minus one. So this is the reason why it's called the anti-symmetric tensor. Tensor is again. Don't let yourself be too worried about the fact that it's a tensor. It's a three-index object. Okay, it's an it's an array with three indices. Those of you who have studied programming. 
should have no difficulty with with arrays of with an n index array right so this is the set of commutators of our poly matrices and this can be summarized by this expression which i wrote down earlier sigma i sigma j is equal to 2 then i is a unit imaginary epsilon i j k sigma k so let me let me just uh, uh as an example work that out for you so this would be sigma 1 sigma 2 okay and according to the expression that i wrote up above this would be equal to sum over k right now i'm going to put the k the sum explicitly 2 i epsilon 1 2 nk right because remember that is epsilon i j k so what is i and j i and j are 1 and 2 respectively times sigma k so now i'm summing over k when i sum over k i get three terms i get epsilon 1 to 1 I get epsilon one to two and epsilon one to three, right? Of these terms, these two are zero, and this is equal to one, right? So sigma one sigma two commutator becomes equal to two i sigma three, right? Which is this expression so you can check that if you put any other uh, indices you will get the corresponding uh, commutator okay and um this this anti commutator relationship also you should verify for yourself it's easy enough to do that and uh so this brings us so this brings us back to this calculation that we were trying to do okay so what 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 is this sigma i sigma j so coming back to this evaluation of this exponential we wanted to understand how to take the nth power so for that we started by looking at the second power which is v i b j sigma i sigma j all right now sigma i sigma j can be uh, written as follows so this is another exercise for you to for you to check i can write it delta i j times the identity plus i and then epsilon i j k sigma k okay so i okay and this is uh, one of the exercises this is exercise 2.3 uh sorry 2.43 in nielsen and so on all right so we so one can use these relationships and uh using these this algebra you can show that this exponential uh, so you can you can do this with the with the square of this uh element and the cube of this element and the fourth power and then after the fourth power everything repeats 
remember it's just like taking the exponential of i theta where theta is a real number you get four elements and then everything repeats then you of the four elements two are imaginary two are real the imaginary part goes into the sine theta the real part becomes the cosine part right okay so what else uh well uh, there is some more uh, uh, a little bit more that is mentioned in nielsen and chuang uh, which is called the polar and singular value decomposition but i will leave this for later when it is needed so to be done later okay so this brings us to the end of our linear algebra at least uh, what we need uh, for our purposes all right and so now uh, i will uh, get started by introducing uh, um gates some quantum gates and the block sphere representation of quantum states okay so before that uh do you are there any questions or comments or any other any uh, sir we have a class right now like we have oh, our no, departmental no. elective starting oh, from 6 okay. all right then i guess i'll i'll stop it here and then on monday uh we will uh begin talking about uh quantum gates and so on we we'll talk, start talking about quantum computation proper okay in the case of p dot sigma we have to take v as adjoint right sorry so in the in case in the case of v dot sigma in the expansion we have yeah. to take v as adjoint right adjoint no, right? no 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 that is <laughs> that is just a normal v dot sigma v is a real vector right see uh, here we 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 said that right that uh, when i wrote this down where did i write it down a uh, v is a real vector right so you can take the adjoint if you want you will just get the same answer right because it's a real vector okay you yes, should got it okay <clears throat> any other question okay then i guess uh, we will uh, we are done with the Uh, algebra part, and then on Monday we'll start talking about uh, the the quantum states, simplest quantum state circuit, uh, and so on. So I would recommend that for uh, for reading for uh, the. Uh, well for today's uh, uh lecture uh, you should uh, basically finish chapter 2 i'm assuming of course that uh, you have been reading means in juang all along uh so this would be section 2.1.7 to 2.1.10 and then for the next lecture we are actually going to go back to chapter 1 uh starting from section 1.3 onwards okay all right so i will see you all on monday okay bye bye